<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this panel event on thinking differently about autism. Uh, my name is Aidan Healy. I'm the CEO of an organization called Lexic. We're a psychological consultancy focusing on autistic and neurodivergent inclusion based in the UK and Ireland. And I'm also the campaign director for Neurodiversity Celebration Week. And we are working in partnership with the founder of Neurodiversity Celebration Week, Sienna Castellan, who really is the kind of visionary, the creator and the curator of these panels today. Um, we are live, so hello everyone. Hello to Lana, hello to Elizabeth. Hello to Jenny, hello to Sarah, and hello to Petra. Please do take some time to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, firstly, before we start, let me just do some housekeeping. Uh, we are live on Zoom webinar. So because we are configured as a webinar, that means we cannot see you, we cannot hear you, neither can anyone else. So please do make yourselves comfortable. This is a 90 minute event and we'll run straight through without any intervals. Uh, the event is being recorded and we will send you a copy of the recording afterwards to the email address in which you registered. Uh, please do share nice comments, your story, your reactions in the chat. Some of our panelists will be reading the chat throughout the session and we really appreciate hearing from you. I will say though that the chat is moderated, so if you are unkind, if you are disrespectful to anybody, you will be muted immediately. And as I said, after the event, we will send you a follow-up email with some social media tags of our panelists, maybe links to their websites, and a recording of this event afterwards. Um, so I suppose just to give you a little bit of background, um, this month, the month of April, marks a number of kind of key dates in the the autism community with Autism Week, Autism Day and Autism Month taking place. And I suppose the view of many people in the autistic community is that while people have well-meaning intentions, they don't quite translate into impact. And a lot of the traditional messaging of kind of autism awareness can actually really alienate autistic people. Um, I'm going to let our panelists speak to why that is, but I suppose the purpose about, of this event is really about thinking differently about autism. We want to help shift and challenge some stereotypes and some outdated views and really amplify, I suppose, the strength and vibrance of autistic culture and I suppose support much needed um, autism inclusion in society. I remember when I started as CEO of Lexic, our founder Nicholas said, you know, a real mark of an ally is to amplify others. So I'm delighted to be working with Sienna today to help amplify a wide range of autistic voices. And I'd like to start by introducing our, panis, our panel host, um, Charlotte Bellour, and Charlotte will then introduce the other panelists. So Charlotte is an autistic woman herself. She's a former merchant banker. She is a corporate governance expert. She's the former chair of the UK's Institute of Directors. And also she's the founder and chair of the Institute of Neurodiversity. And the Institute of Neurodiversity Diversity. It's a global neurodiversity membership organization. Their goal is to bring together, I suppose, neurodivergent people and their allies in a community. And they now have chapters in 13 countries worldwide. Um, so Charlotte, thank you so much for hosting our second panel today. And over to you. Thank you so much for, uh, for your introduction, Aidan, and, uh, and for having me as part of this. And thank you to everyone who's joining us in what promises to be a really fascinating discussion. Unlike other similar events, as, as you heard, you'll be hearing from actually autistic individuals from different countries who will be sharing their stories, insights and experiences. And through that learning, we can all develop. And that's really what we want, we want people to do. Um, I'm, as, as, as Aidan said, autistic myself, late diagnosed. I'm originally from Denmark, but have lived and worked in the UK for 30 years. So this event has been initiated by Sienna, um, who is a 19 year old neurodiversity advocate and author of Spectrum Girl Survival Guide, How to Grow Up Awesome and Autistic. And Sienna has an incredible uh, energy and power to make things happen. She's also the founder of Neurodiversity, Neurodiversity Celebration Week. Uh, which really spread out very globally this year. 
and, and it aims to challenge misconceptions about neurological differences and also bring about neurodiversity acceptance, equality and inclusion, especially in schools and the workplace. So she basically decided to put this event together because almost everything you think you know about autism comes from non-autistic people. Thinking differently about autism will change this, we hope, by putting autistic voices front and center. So for the next hour and 15 minutes, we'll hear autistic voices from England, Germany, and Zambia share their stories and insight. We will be sharing their unique lived experiences and also reflecting on, on their own cultural and societal challenges and what they would like to change and how you can help bring about autism acceptance, equality and inclusion. At the end of uh, the discussion, we'll open to around 15 minutes Q&A where we'll pick questions from, from the chat. Uh, but first I'd like to introduce to, to our fabulous panel. So today you'll hear from Bube Chikumbi from Zambia founder and executive director of Genius Education Zambia and Human Biologist. You will hear from Quinn Dexter from England, writer and presenter at Autistamatic. From Samantha Hugh from England, director of ADHD Girls, speaker, head of communications, commercial model, empowering girls and women with ADHD through effective advocacy, education and specialist insights. Ellie Middleton from England, personal brand manager and great influencer, public speaker and neurodiversity Africa. Sylvan Rosenberg from Germany, adaptive autist, neurodiversity meditation coach, an expert and senior account manager. So to ensure this panel is neurodivergent friendly, I'm going to be asking each panelist specific questions on topics that are specifically meaningful to them. So this will ensure that each speaker has equal opportunities to speak and to speak about something that, that they want to get messages across in. As you may have, have noticed, we have a good balance of, of men and women. Uh, we want to also dispel the myth that, uh, that autism is for men only. It is in fact very evenly balanced and we are slowly finding that out as the diagnostic criteria are more uh, balanced as well, as opposed to leaning to the male presentation. So one of the themes of this panel is to share impacts of getting diagnosed both personally and professionally. The current narrative has been written about us, not by us, but about us by other people and it's led to many misconceptions of what we would, that we would like to correct. We think that by coming together and holding events like this where we can lift our voices, we are rewriting the narrative and building our agency in the world. So Bupe, if we can start with you, what are the mental models relating to autism in your society in Zambia and are you comfortable talking about your autism in public? Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Charlotte, for that question. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us. Um, yeah, so it's a very loaded question, and I'm sure for most people from the African uh, background can actually relate. So the current status quo uh, as pertaining to autism and neurodivergency in Africa, it's riddled by a lot of uh, shame guilt and I would say superstition, especially religious superstition. So because of how uh, little research has actually been done in terms of autism and neurodivergency, there's a lot of myths and misinformation. And the word autism, is a, it's kind of a very taboo word. And uh, most people consider it a very, I would say, derogatory term to use because the stereotypes are, you know, if you're autistic, you know, you are a sociopath, or you know, you've got some mental retardation, you're a violent person, and those are some of the things that we have to face here in my country, Zambia, and just, I think, for most African countries. So most people uh, in society, in our communities, um, they are very dismissive of autism. Uh, some of them, you know, some of those reasons are understandably so, because we face, uh, you know, bigger challenges in society. We know we're battling poverty, we're battling hunger, we're battling so many diseases and it makes the plight of you know neurodivergency and autism the priority is very low for that because the nation is facing i would say you know mm -hmm. bigger problems i'll put that in inverted uh, commas so for most uh, children um their parents are in a lot of denial because as i mentioned there's a lot of religious superstition so uh, the common misconception is that autistic people have demon possession so that's what is that is the status quo in our communities. And because of that, very few parents want to even associate to the label, very few guardians. So you find that children are dismissed in childhood and obviously it goes into 
adulthood as well because no one wants to be associated you know with uh, demon possession and when you talk about some of the remedies that we have now there are things like exorcism because we are a very religious culture so even just um, whatever people don't understand whatever they can't relate to whatever they can't explain um, whatever scares them you know that fear is always translated into religious superstition mm -hmm. here in my country and I think the situation is also exacerbated by uh, the medical facts as well because even the people in the medical field there's very little research that has been done and at this point I think I would just like to quote from an article that was uh, written in 2017 by Spectrum News so I'll just read it um, as it's written so Victor Lotta, a researcher at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, published some of his first description of people with autism in Africa in 1978 paper. He screened more than 1,300 children at institutions for people with intellectual disability in six African countries, and he found nine children who qualified for a diagnosis and 30 others with features of autism. Lotter reported that as with children he had studied in the United Kingdom, Autism in Africa appeared more often in boys than in girls, but compared with the British peers, African children with a condition were less likely to show repetitive and stereotyped behaviors. I'll skip that and address another response from some African researchers who actually went further to delve into what uh, Dr. Lota said. So their analysis did not support Lota's claim. The studies found that autism is fundamentally not different in Africa than it is anywhere else in the world. Researchers in Kenya had uh, reached the same conclusion after a similar review the year before. Personally, I have not come across any indication that there is anything different about the presentation of autism in Africa, says Amina Abukaba, a research fellow at Kenya Medical Research Institute in Kili, who led the Kenyan analysis. The biggest differences are who gets diagnosed and when. Children with autism in Africa tend to be diagnosed at age eight and about four years later and on average than their American counterparts. More than half of the African children with autism are also diagnosed with intellectual disability compared with about one third of American children on the spectrum. This suggests that only the most, so this is the important part why I actually quoted this. So it suggests that only the most severely affected children are being picked up. Those who are diagnosed often speak few or no words and require substantial help with everyday tasks such as eating, going to the bathroom. By contrast, in the United States, the largest diagnostic increases over the past few decades have been in the milder end of the spectrum. So I'll just end the quote there. And the reason why I thought of you know, sharing that is to show that those misconceptions I mentioned, the religious superstition, it's because also with the little research that has been done in Africa, you find that most of it was done for people who are on the far end of the spectrum, and there's nothing wrong with that, but then it has never been considered uh, as a collective spectrum. So, yeah, thank you. And, oh, yeah, for the final question, yes, I'm very comfortable talking about my autism in public. I do understand uh, the risk it poses, but I feel like it's a privilege for me to be comfortable enough to discuss because I'm helping spread a lot of awareness, which will later lead to acceptance. Thank, thank you. you. And that takes a lot of courage. So thank you so much for sharing that. We have really appreciate it. And it's important to understand the differences in a different country. It's also interesting that you have research from outside of Africa, researching inside Africa. You know, we need to, to get some local research going, maybe driven by ourselves. So thank you so much for, for sharing this. So. I'm like a child of the 1960s, which sounds seriously old, which I feel sometimes, but I wasn't diagnosed until in my early 50s. So I'm not sure what the difference would have been if I'd been diagnosed earlier with so much lower levels of autism understanding in my country. So if I can turn to Quinn, you were diagnosed back in the 80s before the spectrum was formally adopted. How much change have you seen in the way autism is understood and accommodated for in those years? Thank you, Charlotte. Good morning, evening, everyone. Um, as you say, I was diagnosed back in the mid 1980s and the idea of the autism spectrum as we know it now was only just forming. When my school was informed of my diagnosis, they couldn't make sense of it. Uh, they actually had to go to look autism up in the public library and I still didn't fit the picture they saw. Um, I was given one choice, 
uh, I could carry on as I was struggling within the existing system or go to a strict boarding school for disturbed boys, which was little more than a borstal. So what was I going to choose? I'm autistic, so I chose safety, comfort, certainty, better the devil you know, and all that. Being autistic didn't get me any concessions or accommodations, so I didn't deny it, but I didn't talk about it either. Occasionally I see a mention of autism on the news or a documentary, but little else at all until 1988 and the film Rain Man. The first time I was in public and I was introduced to somebody who had been told I was autistic, they tipped a box of matches onto the floor and told me to count them, expecting me to do it in an instant. And that was a signal for me that I was going to have to hide. So from then on, I stopped telling anybody I was autistic and that lasted several decades. That world of the 80s, particularly that experience in 88, was very different to what I see around me now. Most people in the West, at least, have at least heard of autism, and that's a start. The image they have of us is distorted and harmful, but at least they know we exist. Now that's awareness. Well done, guys. We've passed the first hurdle. A lot of people now are asking for acceptance, and that's the second stage. But people can accept things even if they don't like them. It doesn't force them to understand or even stop wishing that they could change them. We're getting closer to acceptance in those terms, but what we need now more than ever is engagement. We need people to sit up and listen to our own words instead of the people who've talked about us. Do I think we've come a long way? Yes, I do. Do I think we've got a long way to go? Most certainly, which is why I'm delighted to be here with this fine panel today. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that insight too and for sharing that, Quinn. <clears throat> it is really, I think we are changing, all of us, we're changing things in our country by being here and mm -hmm. by all the people who has joined us as well. So, I mean, as I, I mentioned, I got diagnosed late in my 50s. It was really, really scary for me to go public. I had a lot of, I had a lot of pressure from, from various organisations I work with to go public um, and, and be part of a campaign as well to raise money for autism. And uh, I had to have a family meeting with my children before I, I made that decision because it could, in principle, take me out of work. I didn't know how people would react to it. Uh, I was a professional director of, of different boards and, and uh, yeah, I had to really be sure that I was ready to potentially lose income and lose, uh, lose my career for that. But uh, it's very hard to not speak up. So, so I do believe that my strengths has actually made my career. The strengths of the autism, I'm not saying that I didn't have struggles because I certainly did, especially as a child, with relentless bullying and not understanding why I was bullied, but I understood that later. But I guess I'm lucky work-wise to have always worked with something that has my interest and also in environments with lots of different cultures, people from different backgrounds, like a hundred different countries in a dealing room was super helpful because we were all different. So that addition of being autistic seemed to not play such a big role. It was all about show us the money basically in banking. And I could understand that. So if I can go to Samantha now, like why we do celebrate the strengths of autistics, what should people be mindful of when we're looking to hire an autistic based on these strengths? Thanks a lot, Charlotte. And so interesting hearing everyone's insight as well. Um, I am, I have ADHD and I am autistic, but the latter is uh, a self-diagnosis at the moment because it takes forever to get a formal diagnosis on the NHS. But like you, Charlotte, I had to follow my interests as well. In fact, my nervous system being an autistic ADHD that doesn't allow me to do otherwise. You know, what I should think people need to be mindful of is that we are three-dimensional human beings, you know, with strengths and challenges, but to ignore the challenges and focus so much on the strengths to the level of you pushing it, you know, as this, you know, go standard for what everyone should be, because, you know, some of the strengths for being autistic that comes to mind is that we have great memory, we think in process, we zone into niche areas, you know, and we're highly productive. It's been known that given all we need, right? An autistic has a productivity level of 150%. But does it mean that you have to work to 150% consistently? 
all the time, <laughs> you know, and we have a very direct way of communication, you know, which might help some industry where we're known to be as a specialist. So I'm thinking about the quiet, nerdy person in fan companies where autistic traits are actually celebrated. And this is all great. And as an individual, knowing our own strengths can really help us thrive. But what happens if we're zoning in just on the strengths? You know, we have great expectations coming externally, you know, and for an autistic like me who's late diagnosed, I have had a lifetime of trauma um, that I've accumulated because I'm trying to work out what people are thinking, you know, and most of the time I can't read expressions. You know, some people have learned to do that, but for me, I still get a bit confused sometimes. It People don't really say what they mean. And so, yeah, this is dangerous because we are people pleasers as well. And if we know we go into a job where people expect us to produce magic, we want to do that, right? Because we don't want to disappoint. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that we work to 150%. And within the first month or two, or within the six month mark or one year, we burn out. And what I find is that um, people tend to take leave from their employment because they can't sustain that level of productivity over a long time. You know, and that's why we see neurodivergence, um, you know, especially with ADHD. And I, I've seen autistic individuals as well that don't last in a job longer than two years because they, they need to recover and have a holiday afterwards, you know? And so autistic burnout is a very real thing, especially in women, especially in ethnic minorities and marginalized community where, I mean, I've got to say, I'm a people, people pleaser myself. We have an innate need to do the best for you anyway. So we don't really need that extra pressure. And I've known an autistic girl who had to take herself to A&E because she has such a bad meltdown doing some voluntary work, you yeah. know, that's become a full-time work because she was trying to fulfill that expectations. And what it is, is that maybe there was some problems in trying to uh, instill some, bar um, some, some boundaries you know, which is really important for us, but we might not feel that we can, you know, instill that boundaries because of the expectations. So what we need to do is that we need to empower autistics, not only celebrating their strengths, but figuring out what they need, you know, in, do, in, in order to do their best work, you know, have the well-being support installed into the employment, really find out what people need in order to, you know, um, thrive right because we all have different levels of needs and and so also with um co-occurring conditions you know so some of the strengths that you know autistics have i have adhd too so some of those strengths might not be very obvious to me and might not even i might might, might not even have it you know so it's like don't expect me to have those things when um ADHD and autism, they're sister traits, you know, they tend to travel together quite often. In fact, the co-occurring uh, rate is up to 70%. So then, you know, what if autistic, being autistic and having ADHD is fighting within me and then that kind of sometimes cancel out the strengths, you know, so in order to really bring out those strengths, we need to support people, don't we? We absolutely do. And on an individual basis, right? I mean, I think we have to set up individualized, you know, strengths and weaknesses for all of us in a way that is not, there is not one size fits all. And this is not well understood that we are all as different as you get in the general population. And, and you know, you know, we come with blue eyes, with brown eyes, with, but do you know what I mean? If we are short, we're tall, we are everything. It's not like, oh, we are one type, you can stick into one box. And if you do this, then everybody's fine. No, that's us. I mean, I have ADHD as well as all <laughs> <laughs> um, that had taken me some time to find out because when I was diagnosed, nobody said that that could it could be that or check or checked it. Like you know, and I, you know, it's like we have to know ourselves before we get diagnosed. But we should, I mean, there's professionals for that, right? So anyway, yeah. I mean, I have also been asked. I see there's some chat going on around Brain Man after Quinn mentioned that. I mean, the number of people that have said to me when I said I'm autistic, oh, so what's your special thing? And I'm just like, yeah, I haven't got that. Okay. I haven't got it. Stop asking that question. Move on. <laughs> They're not doing it to insult me, but I get so bothered, right? So anyway, I'm sure I'm not the only one experiencing that. So, I mean, there is an increasing number of sort of famous people going public about being autistic. And there's also an increasing number of autistic advocates, like, like a lot of the people we have in our panels, gathering huge followings and through that growing not only their own voice, but the voice of all of us. So if I can turn to Ellie, Ellie, you've grown a huge audience and community really quickly after your diagnosis. Really, really well done. What have been the best and the worst part about this? 
Yeah, I think um, it's all been quite a bit of a whirlwind. So just for kind of anybody listening, I got diagnosed with ADHD back in October and got my official autism diagnosis literally about two weeks ago. Um, And in that time, I have since October also gone from no kind of audience or community to like 60,000 plus across platforms so it's been a whirlwind six months finding out a lot about myself and also suddenly having a lot of people interested in what I have to say Um, I think for me the most important part about raising my voice was that until that point like this time a year ago I would never have ever considered that I might be autistic or have ADHD Um, you know it was never even a possibility and even if someone had suggested it to me I probably would have been like no I'm not autistic like because the any idea that I had about what autism looked like or presented like or felt like was nothing that I could relate to you know I'd never seen someone like me that was autistic or had like spoken about being autistic and then so it never kind of came up um and me getting my diagnosis or like kind of coming across realizing that I am neurodivergent was just pure luck um, I was having counseling and account I was always kind of like misdiagnosed with anxiety and depression and a counselor said to me has it ever been looked into why you take things so literally I was like no it hasn't I think I know what you're hinting at here and it's just that one comment and I was very lucky that the counsellor that I had at the time happened to have an autistic son um, and so I could pick that up in me and you know just that one comment has led to me going on this whole self-discovery journey actually knowing who I am actually understanding who I am and being so much happier and I think for me it's like if I can use my online platform to make that chance conversation happen for somebody else and then they get their light bulb moment off the back of that um then that's you know amazing that's so important for people to get to that moment because for me I know how much it's changed everything for me you know I'm so much happier I've got a new job I've got an online audience I have so many amazing opportunities and none of that would have happened if it wasn't for that one comment that led me to go away and do loads of research so it's kind of like yeah if I can have that one comment um for somebody else then they're going to get to that light bulb moment too um I think the best parts about building a community and being active online is just meeting people that I can relate to again I never knew anybody kind of like through school or through friendship groups or anything like that that has been autistic and like Samantha mentioned like spent so much time not understanding why I didn't fit in and not understanding you know why I was disliked and why I was always the odd one out and being openly talking about my autism online means that I get to connect with other people that I do um, understand and relate to and do also feel like the outsider so I think it's definitely that connecting with the people um, and I think it's kind of helped my self-understanding too because I've got an audience of people that want to listen to what I've got to say so that kind of encourages me to um, explore the way I'm feeling and explore different things and you know what's going on in the world what are other people talking about and I think it's really good for my own personal understanding of what's going on because I have to then or I don't have to I feel like I like to portray those feelings in a way that other people can understand so I'm taking this like very kind of complicated feelings and like learnings I'm having and trying to communicate that in like three or four sentences online so it really helps me to kind of understand it in a simple way um I think yeah it's obviously been really great to have all this good stuff happen so soon after my diagnosis because it's almost like covered up that kind of grief that can come for a lot of people you know people said to me beforehand you know yeah it's amazing getting your diagnosis and or even self-diagnosing and understanding that you are autistic um but it can come with a lot of grief you know what would have happened if I'd have been diagnosed earlier you know I dropped out of school, I had to decline uni offers, what would have happened, I could have felt, you know, there could have been a lot of grief come up about the fact that nobody had ever realised while I was growing up, Um, but because so much good stuff has happened so soon after getting it, it's almost kind of shown me that, yeah, I was in the exact right place to find out when I did, I was ready to find out when I did, because I was desperate for answers, and I wasn't kind of in that place of being like, no, I'm not autistic, don't, you know, don't tell me what I am and what I'm not, Um, so I think that's definitely a strength. Um, I think 
a tricky part is that obviously growing an audience and doing any work talking about kind of the way our brain works is that it is digging up a lot of that trauma a lot of the time um a lot of the conversations I have and the posts I put out are digging around in things that have happened to me or things that I've found tricky or you know experiences that I've had and there's only so much talking people can do about that um so I guess it's kind of like about finding a healthy balance for all of us that we are so passionate and we get to talk about something that we love and we want other people to understand and we want to raise uh, to raise awareness um but also like understanding that we are human beings that have lived through a lot of trauma and we do have to cut ourselves some slack sometimes too um but yeah I feel very lucky to have had the last six months that I have had um and kind of armed with all the answers that I need to now go forward and do all these exciting things and just to be a lot of a more happy more rounded person I guess fantastic thank you so much for sharing all that with some great comments in you know in our chats everybody loves you Ellie <laughs> so it keeps let's keep it up because you're helping a being a role model for so many and that's super important right yeah. it's uh, I mean it's it, I mean I remember when I was told I had my diagnosis my own biases kind of hit in and I burst out crying and my first thought was what have I done to my children right because I'm thinking maybe I've been a bad mother being autistic maybe there are things I didn't get that I should do and I had to go and talk to them and it was awful right but that was my own biases and they're like assuring me that I have been an okay mother I mean we all make mistakes right Let me go. <laughs> including me but I mean it was quite a lot to go through but being able to talk openly about who you are and what you are is healing I think for sure yeah. and hearing this from you also definitely you know shows that how much healing we can get when we open up and I think it's it's just coming up again and again, the whole idea around, not idea, thing about disclosing. And uh, I think many of us experience uh, like the kind of reactions, like some several people for some reason have said to me, oh, you don't look autistic. I was like, well, let's talk about what autistic looks like, should be. And then of course, that's the end of that conversation. But if we can just go to Sylvan, please. You came out to your employer and, and thereafter quite quickly publicly can you can you share more with us around your experience there please sure um maybe just let me start out a bit early before my day before i actually came out um because i also can highly relate to the trauma that everyone that else is basically talking about so if you were to look at my resume my linkedin profile you see have like i have a say very, very career. It's like I worked as a translator, I worked as a business consultant, I worked in investment banking. And now I work for LinkedIn as a, as a senior account director, which is still a sales role. Um, but what most people don't see is where, so my actual first choice of career was uh, being a performing artist, which kind of got cut short because um, I had a spine injury, which almost brought me into a wheelchair. Um, so that part was gone. And then my second passion was languages. Like I speak, I do speak five languages. So for me, the easy part was just going, okay, I'll go become a translator and go from there. But what people don't see is because of the fact that I didn't have a degree and I was not like probably like everyone else. Um, I was the kind of person that was chronically underpaid. Um, I, when I started out, had three, four or five different jobs at the same time. I would be a, I literally am the kind of person who started out as a dishwasher and now works uh, for a large corporate. So um, I feel that's that kind of moment when I feel like people have need to understand that, yeah, we still are very, can be very successful, but the trauma that we are experiencing while going there can be excruciating. And for me, it's like, I am autistic and I have ADHD. I'm a late diagnosed myself. So I got diagnosed with ADHD and the end of 2018, um, why did that happen? I had a very traumatizing year. I split from my, my husband, my grandmother died. And then I had, was studying in between that time already. And I had been studying from home for two years and everything was completely fine for me. And then all of a sudden I was completely unable to read two pages of a book and memorize whatever I was reading. So I ended up going to a therapist and she diagnosed me with ADHD, put me on medication and that's sort of yeah for the first time like i had been always working like 12 16 hours a day sleep very little i'll never really be able to wind down 
so eventually with the medication that sort of stopped and then it, some CBT, which helped me sort of, yeah, increase my self-awareness, et cetera. Um, and I had been working at a, in the investment banking still. So I ended up because of the fact that I couldn't like combine work and my core values, I was, I can't do this. So I took a sabbatical um, and then in between that time, I ended up um, going, uh, moving from Switzerland to Ireland um, and started working for LinkedIn. And then a few months in, I, um, COVID started basically, I moved, moved to um, Dublin right shortly before COVID. Um, and then eventually I um, found a coach, an ADHD coach, because I felt that therapy wasn't the right thing for me. So um, my, like, I got recommended had the Blackmore, who's an Irish ADHD coach. And with her help, I basically was able to increase my self-awareness. Um, and I unfortunately also got COVID in 2020, which sort of led to a range of health issues, which are now resolved, but eventually it broke down the barriers. So I needed to switch doctors and he just to get my medication. And when I went there, I probably had a very bad day. So I was, as you would call probably a textbook autistic. I didn't look at him. I didn't engage with him at all. And so to sum up the question and going to, I came out of my employer when I came back, like I was off work for a few months because of my health issues, came back and I kind of wanted to help hold back on it because I wasn't sure. And then I'd been talking with my business mentors whether I should or shouldn't be doing this. And eventually I spoke to my business mentors, like, why do you want to do this now? And it's like, just because I have to. And I did. And um, I'd say, and I think that's, not only my company, it's like, I wasn't, it's, I wasn't, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad experience. It's just basically, I told them, okay, they're very like, oh, cool, nice, or good that you've been that open. But beyond that, there was nothing. And then like, it's, yeah, just not wanting to engage with the topic. And so I eventually had a presentation a few weeks ago and I asked a few people within my company, so what would you be interested in, in hearing? Like it's 10 minutes. And the only question I got was, what are the signs and symptoms? So if you ask me, why did I come out publicly? It's, and also to ask my employer, it's because of that same reason, because I want to change that image. And mind yourself, I started, I got that job at LinkedIn because I had a lot of help because back then I wasn't comfortable to disclose my new diversity. Yeah. And getting through into that um, job, I learned every single question and answer. Um, so yeah, very good. Thank you so much for for sharing that. I mean, I mean, being autistic carries with it so many different things, right? Um, and especially in a world that's not very accepting of differences. I mean, if we survive the early years, we do grow resilient in so many ways. But we also carry trauma, right? We carry trauma from many of our experiences, and that you know, I'm 58 now, I'm still working on it, <laughs> right? And I'll continue to do that. But if we have Booper, please, would you, would you just talk to a bit of, to us about how autism has shaped your life? Well, <laughs> I just had to, you know, I have to catch my breath because listening to Samantha, Ellie, and just Sylvan share their experiences, that in itself is also, you know, it's a bit, um, I would say it's, it's triggering and the question itself is triggering in a way that it evokes such a wide spectrum of emotions within myself. How has autism impacted me? You know, everything from neglect to, you know, guilt and just having to deal with inner child issues. So um, for me, I would say autism has impacted me from the time I was very young. And I've been part of the neurodivergency community even before I actually knew that I was autistic. So it's actually a funny story. Uh, like when, like when I was below the age of five, growing up, um, I, I kind of came to the awareness that there was something a bit peculiar about how my mind worked, because uh, teachers would usually point it out. Uh, would, my parents would point it out. You know, relatives would point it out. I was the kid, you know, with the extensive vocabulary. I was doing things that maybe people my age would not do. 
But despite that, I, you know, I shared recently on my LinkedIn, I had a defining moment when I think I was four or five years old, where I was very excited with all, you know, like the attention that um, I was getting for, you know, excelling in so many other areas. And I ran home to share with a, you know, a couple of my friends, like, oh, I can read all these words, I can read all these books, I can do blah, 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 this and that. And I remember one of the older girls, she must have been eight or nine, you know, she looked at me, she was like, yes, Pupe, you can read, but then can you count? And, you know, she sat us down in the living room and she gave us a few, like, exercises. These were simple math questions that we we're supposed to solve. And I remember being very excited to get my result because I thought I was going to, you know, ace that uh, test. And she, uh, you know, I think at the end of 20 minutes, she looked at me and she was like, Whoopi, you got a zero. And I was like, how, you know? And then she was like, you actually switched the sign. So we're asking you to subtract, but then you, you, you know, you, you added everything. So you've gotten a zero. And she was very happy because, you know, kids at that age, you know, it was, it was exciting for her because now she knew the one thing I was not good at. And, I remember that being such a huge defining moment. And even up to this age, I still remember, you know, that moment I reflect on it because I went home and I cried because that wasn't the first time that I encountered challenges, you know, with mathematics and ar arithmetic. So at that young age, five years old, I was battling already two worlds where I'm exceptionally gifted in certain areas, creativity, arts, English, sciences, and then on one end, I had to face the fact that, okay, I'm really bad at mathematics. So I didn't know what this calculia was at that moment, but all I know is that my whole life, um, that has been a huge theme where, you know, I excel in certain things and I struggle in other things. And how that has impacted me is, um, you know, uh, growing up, um, I find that most of the times my interactions with people, people are drawn to me because of certain abilities that I have. Maybe they've read a poem I've written or they've seen a story, they've seen my art, they've, you know, they heard about me doing, you know, music or just, you know, just random, random things like that, that uh, my ADHD makes me, uh, you know, uh, focus on. And they are drawn to that, but in a way it makes, it, you know, it makes you feel very like objectified. And I think those are some of the impacts that people don't realize with the strengths. When you zone in too much on the strengths of the person, you kind of forget the entire being because yes, I can be really good at, you know, painting or drawing, or I'm good at sciences and all those things. But then um, it, it makes me feel neglected because I struggle a lot also with, you know, sensory overload. Uh, my autism, I think one of the most prominent things with my autism is my sensory overload. So my senses, touch, smell, they are just very heightened to the point where recently I actually even developed a psoriasis, which was just caused by the stress of everything. But that's a story for another day. And so, you know, people will focus on, oh, you're good at this. It kind of reduces their capacity to have empathy on you because if you're seen as a gifted person, are you, you know, do you have the rights to ask for empathy for your ADHD or do you have the rights to ask for empathy for these other areas that you're struggling with? And for me, that has been such a huge theme in my life where, you know, like receiving empathy from community, from friends and family, it's very hard because, you know, they just look at me and say, oh, you're really good at this. You don't, you don't need an extra hand because, you know, you've been dealt such good cards. You have all these strengths. You're strategic. You're great at connecting the dots. And yeah, so that's kind of the impact that my, uh, autism has had on me. And on the other hand, also, uh, before I kind of understood what autism was, I remember also being eight years old, watching a show on television. So it was about savants. And, you know, they, uh, they were talking about how their mind works, how they view the world. And I remember asking my dad, like, that sounds a lot like me. And he was like, no, you can't be one of those people because those people are not, they are not normal. Like these are not okay. But, you know, that moment just really stuck and it kind of built a passion for neuroscience because I always felt like I connected and resonated with autistic people. And I've read in the chat, someone said uh, neurodivergent people, you know, they resonate and they can easily identify others. So for me, I've always connected. I've been an advocate for autistic people. I'm always around autistic people. I can always spot them because now that I'm older, I'm realizing it's because I actually already know what they are going through. You know, I'm the person who explained like, oh, we need to turn off the lights because it's too bright. And this is why the child is acting up. Or we need to, you know, this perfume is too strong. This is why the child is crying. So I've been that person for others. But then 
I never quite uh, processed that I could be also an autistic person. And it's funny because I followed that road all the way, got into medical school, wanting to pursue uh, neurosciences and neurology because I felt like I can be a good advocate for, you know, like the neurodivergent people. But now coming to full circle, I realized that everything I had been doing for others in a way, it was actually my subconscious trying to find healing for myself because it's only this year that I've been very aware of the fact that, wait a minute, I do advocate for autistic people. And I know that I call myself, I have OCD, really bad OCD. I have ADHD and I have heightened sensitivity, such a, you know, a low threshold to pain. But I never quite connected those pieces. And, it, you know, and it's, it's kind of a paradox because I'm known for connecting puzzles and pieces. But I think it was just kind of a denial because like I told you in our society and the context of Africa, like I mentioned in the first question, autism is, um, there are a lot of stereotypes and most of them have to do with religious biases. So I think my mind was protecting me from accepting that, oh, this community that I like to be with, uh, these uh, charity places where I volunteer for autistic people, these parents who bring their autistic children to me because they say, I just have a way with autistic yeah. kids. The reason I have, you know, that connection with them is actually because I'm part of them. And it's, right. there's, there's been a lot of emotions just accepting that as Charlotte also said, you know, even for me, I'm, I'm experiencing a lot because now it's kind of like I have to, you know, rethink everything. My reality is being put into question and I have to, you know, come to, uh, you know, like I have to just accept all that. And I think the breaking point for me came when I developed uh, psoriasis because my doctor said, you know, I'm very stressed. Your stress hormones are very high. And it was a moment where I needed to step back and pause because I actually knew where the stress was coming from. The masking, like I spend a lot of time trying to fit in and act like everyone else. You know, I mimic the uh, social cues, it, it was so overwhelming for me that I, eventually my immune system crumbled and it manifested in psoriasis. And I don't think everyone has to reach a breaking point for them to, you know, find that acceptance that they require. Because for me, I, I thought like I would never be accepted. So I might as well just fit in. And sometimes the price is very high. It can actually come at the expense of your health. So it's, it's yeah. very validating to be in such a space and have uh, these kinds of interactions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing all that. I think the heightened sensitivities is something we all um, experience. I mean, I can smell when people are ill. I thought everybody could that. People smell distinctly differently when they're ill. I, <laughs> I didn't even question that I might be a bit on my own on that one, but I now know I'm not because many of us uh, feel this, right? But but those heightened sensitivities, those press, I think, gets, gets us more stressed and therefore the stress affects our immune system all the time. So I was always more ill. And uh, the child I have as neurodivergent is also more ill than, than my other children. And it, it's, uh, it, yeah, it was so obvious. I was autistic when I was a child, but because nobody knew about it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, being dealt with. And that causes extra stressors for sure. I mean, we are fighting for autism acceptance and inclusion all over the world. And we are finding barriers of all kinds in all countries. I think a, a, a variety of research have been conducted over the years, which should have increased the overall understanding of autism. But I think we're still very far away from a broader awareness and even further away from acceptance and proper inclusion in all aspects of society. So if I can turn to Quinn, please, your work often questions the validity, validity of contemporary autism research. Why do you think this is not going in the right direction and how would you improve it? Thank you. Um being autistic can be very disabling for some of us. I'm not just thinking about those of us with co-occurring conditions. Um, just being autistic can be very debilitating and obstructive to taking part in society. Our sensory considerations, emotional differences, a need for veracity are varied in how well they gel with the world we live in. Despite the earlier studies of Sukareva in Russia and the simultaneous work of uh, shall we say, a certain German doctor. It was Leo Kanner who defined early understanding of autism. And that was primarily through the study of children who presented in a very conspicuous manner. Um, what Bupe was saying earlier on about how autism uh, research is in Africa at the moment is very reminiscent of that. As well as the core differences in thought that define us as autistic, many of those kids had difficulty communicating, had intellectual disabilities, movement disabilities, and so on. 
Their behaviours were interpreted as being symptomatic of autism, the outward expression of a fault in the mental works. And that's how the model for autism research has remained ever since. The autists treated as a subject for study and speculation by non-autistic scientists. Our behaviours are noted down and our motivations inferred by statistical analysis. They study primates, rodents and microscopic worms, alter their brains to make them behave in the antisocial or selfish ways they believe typify us and claim to make breakthroughs. All of this is being done when there are intelligent, eloquent, autistic people who could just tell them the answers if they were willing to listen. Autism from the inside looks very different to autism from the outside. We know. We spent years talking to each other and building consensus, and there's a hell of a lot the current crop of non-autistic researchers and theorists have got wrong. All that animal research is pointless when you can actually talk to us, and the genetic research must stop. Because until autism is redefined on the basis of autistic observation and input, you can't know which genes you're going to be looking for. Now, there is hope on the horizon because there's a, a growing number of autistic scientists and academics producing some fantastic work that really does resonate with other autists. I think of things like monotropism, uh, the double empathy theory and so on. But their voices are still constantly drowned out by the geneticists and the vivisectionists with their catalogue of deficits. So for a future research to be a benefit to us, it must start with a true consensus on the nature of autistic thought. And that starts with autistic voices. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Very, very thoughtful and also provoking, which is good uh, for us to, to think a bit deeper about these kind of things. Um, I mean, I mean, for, for me as an undiagnosed child in the 60s, I did find school super, super difficult uh, throughout. It wasn't until I started working that I found it a lot easier. And I was seen as dumb in school, um, which took me some decades to get over and realize I do actually have a brain. As through my childhood, I was told I was uh, not smart. And actually they used the word dumb. Um, there are many discussions about this, the whole spectrum thing and the different labels depending on support needs. And recently there's been discussions uh, around this, whether there should be a classification as profoundly autistic. And, and if I can turn to Samantha on this one, Samantha, the high functioning label, why is that harmful? Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I came across this concept of survivorship bias very early on in my advocacy journey. And when people were saying that, oh, you're high functioning, you know, like, it doesn't matter to you, you know, you're not gonna have these problems that everyone, you know, known to have. So the concept of survivorship bias is when society turns its attention to successful individuals. You know, we are ignoring the needs of those who didn't actually achieve what they thought they should achieve by a certain life milestone. And so this can cause a lot of problems, you know, especially within neurodivergence who don't actually have the manual to life to begin with, you know, and actually have to look to other people. How come everyone seems to know what they're doing? We don't know what we're doing, right? And then why are we focusing on people who succeed despite the odds or take big risks? Risk. You know, and even Elon Musk have been known to say that would people want to be me when they know what it's really like to be me, you know, because you only see the picture on the outside, you know, just because you appear to be, to be functioning, you hold down a job, calling someone high functioning can minimize their disabilities, like immediately make me feel like I can't actually talk about the things that I feel challenging because these are the things I need to hide, you know, because we all have coping systems. Yeah our internal lives that people don't know about you know like for for example you, you, um, charlotte you talked about feeling like a bad mother like i felt like that forever you know because there's this guilt of not being there enough you know because in order to keep up with everything you know with a business with the work and drinking enough water eating enough you know looking after the kids it takes everything out of you you know, and also the sensory difficulties, you know, that come with having children, especially small children who are very loud, very tactile, you know, we jump over you, things like that, you know, it, people don't know. And, and it's tough to explain as well, you know, and you've got to be your biggest advocate because how are you going to continuously explain to someone why your brain is having a meltdown when people don't see it on the outside, yeah. you know, 
it's, it's, it's really tough. Something had to give, right? And so there are some, 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 some of the examples of autistics that were given the high functioning label. You know, um, for my, myself, for example, I capitalized on my love, an obsessive love of biology when I was in school. And before that, I, I was probably underachieving until I found something I loved. So I love discussing scientific concepts with my lecturers. You know, so this is something that I felt I got a recognition for because, you know, my, what, what, what I was thinking in my brain really kind of uh, what was very well received. But then because I was this very annoying person who was always putting my hand up in a class whenever, you know, the lecturers asked for a question, um, then I became very unpopular with my friends. You know, because I appeared to have everything under control and, you know, I looked like I was quite sociable and then people didn't know why I didn't make an effort to be their friends. You know, I spoke about it. Um, I wrote about it recently in an, an article, of my live experience. I actually encountered some bullying, you know, as a result, because just because it looks like I was doing well, you know, I was clever. You know, it doesn't mean that I was okay with the social relationship part, you know, for the life of me, I still don't understand a lot of females, <laughs> you know, how they think. Oh, and the there's, there's some difficulty in actually participating in female conversations yeah. because, you know, there's a whole new level of sophistication. Yeah. <laughs> and so you don't see the immense labor that goes underneath what it takes to appear normal. Yeah. You know, and the areas of life where we have serious challenges. Yeah. So you know, that this is, this is difficult for people who are labeled as high functioning, but actually don't feel like high functioning and struggle on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. What, yeah, what, 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 what does it take, right? Thank you so much for sharing that. Really, really relatable uh, for me, definitely. And I see from, from our panel, from our audience as well. I mean, we all have unique individual experiences of being autistic. And I mean, Ellie, we would like to just hear a bit more from you as well around how you think being autistic actually helped, and you charged down on it, but but we like to hear more, help you both excel in your career and build your audience online. So yeah, I think like we touched on kind of throughout the session that these kind of autistic strengths can be so harmful, you know, when people think that you're going to be a genius or you're going to be, you know, able to count the matches, like Quinn was saying. And I think sometimes the things that we actually are good at we don't even realize that we're good at and other people don't associate with autistic people at all. Um, I think like for me, I've kind of learned, you know, I work in marketing now um, and I kind of realized that being autistic and being a specifically an undiagnosed autistic person for such a long time, masking throughout my teenage years was marketing. It was trial and error of what is well received by audiences and what is not. I spent my whole life being like, okay, if I say something in a blunt way, people don't like that. If I speak my mind, people don't like that. Um, if I talk too much about the things that I like, people don't like that. Like Samantha was saying, if I ask too many questions, people don't like that. But I kind of learned through trial and error that, okay, if I package it in this way if I add a bit of humor then that's quite well received so we'll try that one again um if I you know mimic the people around me then that's quite well received too so we'll try that one again and that whole process of understanding the things that people do and don't like is really beneficial as a marketer because that's what marketing is all about it's about understanding your audience and giving them the things that they're going to receive well and you know I think if someone was to say from the example you know from the stereotype that's out there at the moment you know what jobs would autistic people be great at it's the data it's the analysis it's processing it wouldn't be you know marketing or public speaking or content creation and um, but all of the things that we do is so kind of closely tied to the things that we don't even realize we're doing in a different way to other people um, and I think that's why kind of diagnosis and self-diagnosis and self-discovery is so important because I would have never have considered myself to be more aware of what people do and don't like because I didn't know that everybody didn't spend their time faking what they were doing to be kind of well received by everyone around them. I think it's so similar with like ADHD as well. Like before I realized I had ADHD, I never thought that I was creative because as far as I was aware, everybody had a thousand ideas all the time jumping through their head. I didn't know that everybody else's brain was quiet. I thought that everybody's brain was as chaotic as mine. Um, and if I never found out that I 
had ADHD, I would have never have like been kind of like proud of the ideas that I have, or I would have never even known that that was a strength that I had because I didn't realize that not everybody worked that way. And I think it's so kind of important to have that dig around and have that, you know, knowledge of what it actually means and what experiences we actually have that are so closely related to autism and that not everybody has. Um, because yeah, otherwise we wouldn't know that we're even doing it because as far as we're aware, we just think that everybody works this way. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, when you get diagnosed, that doesn't happen at the moment. You know, I got my diagnosis and it's like, yes, OK, you pass the criteria, you're autistic, you can go now. There's no like handbook to say, OK, this is the things that you might find tricky. These are the things that you might find easier than other people. There's no kind of map of the spectrum and the, the ways in which you excel and the ways in which you struggle. And I think that is so important. You know, that is what being part of the autistic community have done for me because you know I can go on TikTok and I can see somebody saying oh you know I had this experience and I can go oh my god that happened to me too I do that I didn't realize that that was an autistic thing um, and I can see people having conversations and people experiencing things in the same way that I do um, and I think you know until you hear somebody else talking about it you never even realize you know I get to a point sometimes where I think do I even have a personality like every single thing as I come across it I'm like oh that's an autistic thing too oh that's an autistic thing too and I think it makes so much sense and it makes you feel so validated as a person you know yeah. you spend all those years um whether you're kind of undiagnosed or maybe even when you were diagnosed younger but kind of didn't know how you fit into the world um yeah you spend so long feeling like an outsider and feeling like you don't quite you know you're like an alien almost and as soon as you connect with those other people that do have those shared experiences it makes everything make a lot more sense and it highlights the things that you know we as a community are so great at that other people and we don't even realize yeah thank you thank you so much for sharing for sharing that i mean i have to say i simply cannot control myself talking about things that are special interest i call them passions because i like that word better but i go on and on it's bad so <laughs> I haven't learned. Um, so and maybe I never will. Actually, maybe I've decided I don't want to learn. People have to listen to my wise words here, right? <laughs> so I mean, a number of autistic people have told me that that they don't know what accommodations to ask for at work, especially often HR people say, So what accommodation do you want? And it's like, I was like, could I have strawberry cake every day, please? And they're like, Oh, that's not in our accommodations. Well, well, why open up such a big like question it tell me what you can do what is a menu i can choose from so moving to sylvan i mean have you asked for accommodation in the different jobs and which kind of accommodation and how was that supported mm -hmm. well in my previous jobs i didn't simply because of the fact that i didn't i didn't have the diagnosis i didn't know so i only really really have disclosed it a couple months ago which was like early december um, have I asked for accommodations? A few. They were mainly while the, the office was still on low capacity. So like being able to go to the office every day, it's, um, like a few little things, but generally, no, exactly for the same reason. Um, maybe also touching on the earlier question, I haven't really asked for the accommodations because of the fact it's, to be blunt, it's a black hole. Yes. You don't know what you can ask for. You know that legally you're protected as you, 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 you can ask for them. You're protected to disclose yourself, but that's about it. And I feel a lot of people don't come out or don't ask for accommodations because they are afraid to ask for them or they wouldn't even know what to ask for that's at right. some point. And then I feel that's, that's something that needs to change. And then I think going a step further once to say, some things are very, very easy, such as like providing headphones, different spaces, dimly lit, etc. That's easy. But I feel going a step further is to see, encourage people to disclose, encourage people to ask for accommodations because it's optimizing the business performance. Yeah. But then also finding ways to break up the, the, the classic, say, job models, say, because for a lot of autistics, it's hard to fit in just one role. So rather than giving, like interviewing them for one role, try to build a role around their skills yeah. uh, as much as possible or give them room to explore other things in order to keep them engaged. And I feel that's something that's, that, that is, yeah, it's, it's been 
I've seen the change over the past two years, but um, I feel now it's really the time to push and say, okay, we, we need to um, discuss this more openly. And yeah. yeah, like talk to autistic people, talk to the, the few people that, that are in, especially in corporates, it's rare that people are out. Yeah. It's like talk to those people and try to find and try to engage and try to find ways to, yeah, um, in, engage the other 2% that aren't neurotypical. That's right. I mean, I'm, I'm really a strong believer in universal tools. It would be great if there was a menu that everybody, so you don't have to disclose, right? Eventually, it should not be necessary. The North Star, we don't have to say that we're autistic because actually the world is inclusive. That's why we are going to, it might not happen in my lifetime, but if we can lay a strong foundation for that direction of travel. So, so what I would like to see in menus where you can tick boxes, you know, when you go for to a spa and this, you have all these boxes you take. Same thing for everybody. Everybody gets the opportunity to tick boxes of what they would like, of things that the, that the company can accommodate, right? Then that must be the way for, in, for you know, interviews for everything, but we need to push for it and then give the input into what should the boxes be, yeah? And then hopefully we can, we can get to that place. So I would just love to see a world where knowledge about autism and neurodiversity is just part of everybody's general knowledge in a whole different way. And, and I mean, Bupe, if I could just turn to you and ask, you know, what do you wish that more people knew about autism? Oh, you've gone to the side. There you are. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the tech challenges of uh, using your mobile device. Uh, so for me, I think what I would like uh, people to know about autism is, I think three main things. The first one being autism is, it's not a disease. It's just a normal uh, biological variance of the human mind. And it's as common as everything. It's as common as, you know, the sun rising every day, the sun setting every day. It's a very normal process and we shouldn't even have to stand out and by it being normal I feel like it should also be followed with a lot of um, acceptance acceptance by people because sometimes as an autistic person uh, people kind of invalidate your experience and you know they want to minimize uh, your worldview like in my case most of the times because I seem to be a very functional person on the outside I look okay so it's very hard to even prove my autism and no one should feel like they have to you know prove their existence because like I mentioned autism is a variance of the human mind so in the same way we can't see our brains unless you maybe dissect your you know <laughs> your skull or something sorry to be graphic but like in the same way we can't see the, the the brain or the mind that's the same way that autism presents itself so I'm you know we, I can come out looking okay but then what lies underneath is it's a lot of things. So for instance, in my case, sometimes, you know, even with medical personnel, uh, my pain is always kind of, you know, it's minimized and trivialized. So, so I've, I've had situations where, you know, doctors have reduced my pain experience to a dramatic person. So I think for most of my life, I've always been considered dramatic because I cry, you know, I cry when everything happens because I just feel the pain so intensely and I can't understand how other people don't feel it like that, you know, like, a simple injection for me it feels like it's you know like a train ran over me and you know when you're explaining that to people sometimes they think you are being dramatic or ex you're exaggerating but it's just the way um my nervous system handles a sensory stimuli i don't like to be touched so i you know I, I look okay i look normal but i think i can count on my hand how many times i've hugged people in the past two years because i just don't i don't like human touch i don't like human contact so um, even when people, you know, when people look at me, they, they assume I'm the most normal person. And yes, I am very normal, but then we are just different people. So I don't like bright lights. I can't, you know, I can't stay in a room that is, you know, very uh, lit. And because of, because of my uh, sensory overload, I find that every single day I'm actually trying to heal from a migraine because when my nervous system is overstimulated. I have like in very severe migraine headaches and that is my everyday life. I've yeah. lived this way, you know, since childhood. So migraines are a normal part of my life. And for other people, they can go to parties, you know, they can, they can leave the house, you know, interact with the world and they are fine. But then for me, it's, it's a huge problem and people don't see that is what happens behind the scenes that after every interaction, I have a severe migraine that I have to deal with and so there's, there's a lot of acceptance that is needed. And secondly, what I would like people to know also is um, 
you need a support system, you need to support autistic people the same way that everyone else is supported. And I'm privileged to have my sister. My sister is very supportive. And my friend who's actually one of my best friend has joined this core. I've seen her in the core and she's very supportive. Uh, and for me, that has been, it's been a way that I, you know, I view the world because I'm able to understand my differences by uh, having the conversations with them. So there are certain times where, you know, people think I'm very blunt, um, brutally honest. And in my case, I didn't even realize I was doing it. Sometimes people think I'm just being negligent with my words, but then I'm just a literal person. So sometimes my sister will pull me to the side and tell me, oh, when you're in this social setup, uh, you're actually not allowed to say this because people will perceive what you've said in this other way. And I don't know if I would, I would have had a very great experience of the world if my sister did not take up that role of kind of being my second eyes and ears because she's, she always helps me kind of, you know, filter my um, autism, you know, traits with what is considered socially okay. And that has been such a huge gift for me. So you need a lot of acceptance as well. And uh, thirdly, just a final point, what I would like people to know is ask yourself what exactly is normal. Yeah. And, you know, because what, That's like, how, normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, how do you define normal? And I've taught people this all my life, because, you know, with me, my sensory overload is so intense. I remember in university, I couldn't even stay within campus because it was so overwhelming. And I would tell my friends, like, I can't even live in this space with all of you. I, I don't share a space, like, living spaces, I can't do that, like, share a room with people, it's very overwhelming for me. And, you know, sometimes my friends would joke and say, you know, your miss is overwhelming. Like you, with you, everything is overwhelming. And my mom has also told me that like, Bupe, everything overwhelms you, like the entire world overwhelms you. And like, for me, I, I only use the word overwhelming because I'm comparing myself to everyone else. But mm. in the reality of things and in the big, uh, you know, context of things, that is my normal. Like. What others would feel at a level 50%, for me, it's maybe 250%. But none of those experiences is abnormal or one is, you know, better or less than the other. It's just very normal for me to perceive the world in that way. And I feel like autism has been such a gift for me. My yeah. neurodivergency has been a gift because my ability to feel so intensely and perceive color and texture, it's what makes me the artist that I am. It's why I'm able to, you know, paint the way I paint because I can, like, I, I see color the same way, you know, people are able to see numbers and all those things. For me, that's a very in, um, inherent process. So it's very easy for my art. It helps with my art. It helps me with my, you know, my music, my piano, because if I didn't have the, you know, the heightened sens uh, sensitivity, I wouldn't be able to do some of the things that I do. And most of those things are things that, people celebrate in me. So I feel like they kind of robbed me of the whole experience because on one end, you're happy that, oh, I excelled in this, I pursued this. But then, you you know, on the other end, you don't realize that I'm only able to do those things because of these traits that you consider a disease. Mm -hmm. So it's either you you accept me for, you know, every all of me, or you just consider me an outcast. So those are some of the thoughts, uh, final thoughts I wanted to echo with everyone. What exactly is normal? Because really, what is normal? Thank exactly, you. Exactly, yeah. Let's, let, I think I decided I don't even want to find it. In fact, I like that word to disappear. <laughs> right, so thank you very much for that. So in the interest of time, and I want to just have the other, we, we've run a bit over, so some of the other answers I really want to get out. So we're going to eat in a bit to the, um, to the Q and A time, but, but Quinn, I know that, that you're mentioning the autistic triad in your work as distinct from the autism triad of impairments, uh, which is often spoken of in medical and academic circles. Can you explain a little about what it is and how it differs from the established deficit model? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> I have to say an awful lot of the topics that we've uh, picked up on, including the last one of what exactly do we mean by normal, um, working accommodations, the relief, grief and belief people go through at diagnosis. I've got videos on those. I've just posted one of them about uh, our different relationship with pain, if anybody's interested. Um, the triad of impairments goes back to the 1970s. <clears throat> it suggests that our nature can be summed up as a list of deficits, namely communication, social skills and routine or repetition. It's based on the flawed assumption that there's an objective measure we can apply to all of those things, whereas in fact they're subjective, incredibly malle malleable and evidence all around us. 
communication varies immensely, even within languages and cultures, as do social traditions and expectations. Routine and repetition are both essential for societies to function, for advertising to work, for memes to make people laugh and for politicians to get elected. The science that gave us the triad of impairment was, as I described earlier, based on observation and statistics. The same techniques we use to study animal behaviour. It has more in common with zoology than it does psychology. The autistic triad is a way of looking at autism from the inside out rather than the outside in. Try not to knock my microphone. Um, until very recently, all the knowledge about autism came from people studying us. But as more and more of us talked and shared our innermost thoughts, feelings and motivations, we built an understanding of why we don't appear to fit in. And it lies in the way we um, sense and process information. All of the behaviours at the core of the deficit-based view can be traced back to differences in senses, emotional processing and veracity. Sensory overwhelm and interceptive gaps can cause us dis significant distress, but our sensory differences can also motivate us and provide us with information others miss. Our emotional processing can make us incredibly sensitive to emotional states, which can be distressing or even too much to handle, but it can also make us sensitive, perceptive and loyal. Our veracity or our need for clear, unembellished and complete information may seem like pedantry, black and white thinking or inflexibility, but it can also be seen as a strong moral compass, innate desire for honesty and trustworthiness. The autism triad of impairment was conceived before there was a concept of an autism spectrum, before there was an internet and before autistic people had a chance to talk to each other in the way that Ellie's been describing, before non-speaking autists had access to communication tools and before autism was widely known. The autistic triad of distinction is a product of more than two decades of autistic people trying to work ourselves out from within. And I think we've done pretty well so far. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I, I love the, the triad. Uh, thank you for having put that together. We should all share that everywhere so people can understand another way of looking at this. Going straight to Samantha, what can we, in your opinion, do to help autistics? Yes, it's so interesting hearing what Quinn says and also Bupa about how autistics see and experience the world. One thing I wish I had more of is well-being support. As uh, Ali said, there's a lot of grief that comes with the late diagnosis of autism. And uh, for me, I've just come out of the ADHD grief cycle. Now I'm going into <laughs> the autism grief cycle. But you have the denial and the anger, and then you're bargaining with the world, and then you get a little depressed. And then eventually you might accept, but then you might go through the whole cycle again. You, you never know because part of being late diagnosed is to figure out how you can unmask and figure out what your coping system is, where your coping system starts, and where, where is the actual person inside you, right? And so for me, you know, it'd be so helpful to have, to be able to write your own user manual, you know, the map, like Ali say, of how we thrive and a map of how we struggle, you know, because having that map, you know, would be, you, you can use it, you know, in life and in work, you know, because then you can advocate for yourself, and how we're going to help uh, people thrive, you know, you're going to find out the areas of intersectionality, where being autistic intersects with other factors, like what other any conditions you have. You know, a lot of autistics also grew up with developmental language disorder, you know, where is, there's difficulty in uh, reading and stringing the words together and stuttering, which I actually suffer from from a young age. Um, anxiety, you know, which is something that nearly all autistics have, you know, especially social anxiety, ADHD, which is a sister uh, trait, as, as we talked about, and the depression that, you know, sometimes follow us, um, and how it also intersects with social and cultural, you know, factors. So to see this person as a three-dimensional human being, rather than having the label of being autistic, because these labels are created by human beings, you know, and these labels will change in time. Asperger's are not even in the DSM-5 anymore, right? And so what is it going to be in about 50 or 100 years, right? Because 100 years ago, ADHD was not like how it is now, you know, and 
I think as um, autistics, you know, we have come a long way, you know, in improving their awareness. You know, and then people are taking notice to the point that companies are chasing to hire autistic individuals. You know, so how do you empower the individual? How do you create these conditions where everyone feels belong? You know, and there's a culture of compassion where we don't feel worried about telling people where we struggle, right? And yeah, so, so it, it, it's a whole spectrum of things, you know, why we're different. We have different senses, needs, you know, the triad that Quinn talked about, you know, it requires us to have a different environment needs. And communication can be an issue because we don't often want to choose the verbal side of communication. So this is interesting because personally, I would prefer to write everything down and then, you know, talk to you or maybe just write to you instead of talking to you, right? So that's why maybe I don't want to go into the office because I would prefer even having this one-on-one -on -one Zoom is it's better for me than actually going into a big crowd where I don't know when I can say something without putting my hand up, right? Which looks silly now as you're 40 years old. So, so yeah, so, I mean, so there is a, yeah, it'd be great if we all have a manual to, to explain how we are because we're so misunderstood as human beings. Yeah, I know, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that again. Um, I mean, re receiving diagnosis and understanding or trying to understand this, it means so many things, different things to different people, right? I mean, when I got diagnosed, I was like, okay, so people say, so what difference does it make? I was like, well, it changes nothing, but it changes everything. I had to look at 52 years with different sets of lens, everything, and I still cannot still do that. So nothing changes, but everything changes for me. And, and Ellie, I, I want to just turn to you now. I know that you already talked a lot about what changed, but what would you like to add from hearing the rest of us as well? Yeah, I think like that's a really important, that's the thing that I say all the time to people, you know, nothing changed, but everything changed. And I think so much good comes from getting a diagnosis, you know, the understanding, the finally feeling validated, feeling accepted, um, feeling like you belong somewhere. But like you said, it, it can be so tricky and it can be so exhausting. I think yeah, because yeah. when I finally got my awesome diagnosis, I was already kind of like self-diagnosed for quite a long time. It's such a long process. And I was just kind of set on, you know, I want my diagnosis that I did not even consider how much the assessment can actually take out of you you know it's yeah. like an hour or two hours or however long it takes of digging up all your life experiences and making you look at them in a new way and I think that is such an important thing for people to remember you know I felt really strongly that I wanted to get diagnosed um, but now knowing what the experience was like I could have quite happily stayed self-diagnosed you know yeah. nothing's actually changed with somebody telling me you know I if I could have got to that point where I did feel kind of strong enough in my own decision that I knew I was autistic um it would have saved a lot of tiredness and a lot of exhaustion I think yeah. um I just think yeah it can be so strange to look back at your whole life and realize so many of the things that you were sure happened one way probably didn't happen that way or maybe you just misunderstood or yeah. you know maybe it was just like lost in translation almost yeah. um but yeah I think it's it definitely changes the way that you look at the past yeah. I think it changes the way that I look at the future as well you know kind of things like I, because I was misdiagnosed with anxiety and depression, I was kind of always under the impression that those things would go away, you know, like, oh, I'm just having a bad time with anxiety now, like, when I'm grown up, I won't be so anxious, or when I'm a grown up, sounds won't bother me so much, and I'm like, okay, no, those things are never, they're never going away, they're part of who I am, and that definitely kind of affects my life choices going forwards, you know, do I want to live with somebody because it's still going to annoy me as much in 20 years That's if they're noisy in the house as it annoys me now? Do I want to have children because, you know, I'm still going to get, I'm still going to need my sleep. I'm still going to get really kind of overwhelmed if someone is screaming down my ear. Um, yeah. And I think it does, you know, having that information is, it's kind of scary to have that information, but it's also so important to have because you know what you need to what you're going to struggle with you know what you need to put in place to have the most like the happiest and most comfortable life going forwards um, and I think yeah having that understanding and that education it, for me it now feels like I'm at a point where 
I've got all the answers, you know, I know that I'm autistic and I know that I have ADHD. Now it's kind of on me and the people around me to use that information to set my life up in the most meaningful way. Yeah. You know, I know that I need to value my free time. I know that I'm prone to burnout. So I need to schedule in time for peace. I know that I need structure. So it's up to me to put that structure into my life. And I think, you know, having that information is so important for people to know that about themselves so that they can set themselves up in the best way for happiness and success. Thank you so much for that, Ellie. We have just one very final question for Sylvan and then we'll have to close off. I'm afraid we've missed out on the Q and A's, but we've seen all the comments along the way. And I think we've addressed a lot of it. Sylvan, very quickly for you, what do you feel is missing to make the working world more inclusive? Um, I probably could talk about this for hours, but um, to make it brief, in my view, the world's problems are based in either miscommunication or ignorance. And the choice really is to either engage to solve the former or be the problem and stay at the latter. Thank you. Thank you so much for that short, succinct answer to that. Thank you very much to all our speakers today. Thank you very much to all the delegates. I hope you're going to lead this discussion with a more nuanced understanding of what it means to be autistic and thinking about autism in different ways. Thank you so much to all of you. Aidan, do you want to close up for something? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Charlotte, and thank you very much to all of our panelists. Um, panelists, now is a, a lovely time to open up the chat if you haven't been looking at it, as you were getting lots of nice comments and lots of nice thank yous there. Um, I, I'll just close with a few quick remarks, which is, look, I think it's so important that any autism inclusion initiative, whether that's during Autism Month or another time of the year really listens to and involves and champions the perspectives of people it claims to be serving. Um, and in Lexic, we really see far too many autism awareness days and campaigns with parents and educators and HR professionals and medical professionals and no autistic representation. So it's a real pleasure to listen to you all today. Thank you to Sylvan, Ellie, Samantha, Bupa and Quinn. And obviously Charlotte, a real special thanks to you for not just hosting this panel, um, but also our first panel today as well. And look, we call this event Thinking Differently because we want to change perspectives around culture, around gender, Autistic people are very different from one another. And while a label can help tell you about a group of people, it's so important to listen to individuals. And finally, I think for me, awareness and acceptance doesn't just mean tolerating people's existence. It means truly appreciating, accepting the way they move through the world and that those differences can be a good thing. You know, we heard today about trauma and masking and shame and that is a world we want to try and change so thank you again everyone thank you to our panelists thank you to charlotte for hosting we will send you a follow-up email with some panelists links their social media tags all of our panelists are very active year round so please do follow and subscribe they are posting on social media they are writing they're doing videos um, and you will also get a recording of this panel and our other panels today afterwards as well. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. It was a, a really lovely session. And um, Team Lexic, we will, we will just end the webinar there. Thank you.